Grace Commons, we are so glad to be with you this morning. And this week, we have a couple announcements for you. First, our Roots 55 Plus Up ministry is going to be doing some exciting trips to Denver. Uh, they have two planned, so make sure to go check out the website and register online because spots are limited. Next, Grace Commons is looking for more people to join our leadership team. And so if you have any interest in being an elder, deacon, or trustee, and God's putting on your heart to lead in a different way or a new way at Grace Commons, or just try something different, please jump on our website and either nominate yourself or someone else for these positions, as well as you can ask someone at a table in the narthex if you have more questions. Lastly, if you are a middle school or high school student or a parent of those students, we have camp this summer, which is really exciting. Middle school is going to be going to Glorieta in New Mexico, and high school will be going to Angel Fire, New Mexico. Lots of fun things, lots of surprises. So go to our website to read more information as well as to claim a spot as spots are limited. With that, let's continue in worship. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here, and it's good to have you join us online, if that's where you're from. My name is Craig Rancamp. I am a member of this congregation. It is good to see you here, and I'd like to call us to worship by reading from Hebrews chapter 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Let us worship God in Christ. Stand if you're able as we sing our first hymn. like to read, uh, please take a seat. I'd like to read this morning's passage from scripture. If you'd like to read along, it'll be on the screen up here, or you can open or turn on your Bible. This is written uh, by Isaiah about 730 years before the coming of Christ, and it's response to the Assyrian invasion. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with his righteousness he will judge the needy 
With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Please stand as we sing another hymn. Please be seated. If you're new here to Grace Commons, what, you, what we're going to be doing next might seem culturally odd. We're going to be speaking with a couple hundred of our closest friends about the things we do wrong in our relationships with them or within our relationships with God. It's called a prayer of confession, and it actually comes from the Bible. In um, James chapter 1, I'm going to read a little bit from verse 15 to let you know where this comes from. He says, uh, prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sin, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. So let us read this prayer of confession in unison aloud, and we'll have some quiet time for our own confessions at the end. Holy God. Through your powerful word, you created and sustain all things. Your word and deed exist in perfect union. You've made us in your image. You call us to congruence. Our words and deeds are meant to coincide. That we have divided from where speech confuses rather than clarifies. We make promises and don't keep them. We twist words and ideas, and often our actions contradict what we say. Lord, forgive us. Hear us as we confess these sins and others in silence. In Jesus' name, amen. Both John and James tell us our confessed sins will be forgiven, so please hear this assurance of that forgiveness from Isaiah 118. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. 
Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Please join me now as we confess our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Well, once again, welcome everyone. Uh, today is the first Sunday of Easter Tide, also known as International Associate Pastors Preaching Sunday. <laughs> we are starting a new sermon series called Close Encounters with Jesus, and what we're doing in this Easter season is going back, back to look at Jesus with fresh eyes. We're gonna be looking at encounters that individuals have with Jesus. And today we're gonna to look at the very first one. We're gonna spend this time, this sermon series, in the Gospel of Mark. A couple words about Mark. Mark, as some of you know, is the shortest gospel of the four gospels. It doesn't have infancy narratives like Matthew and Luke. Mark uh, loves a good story. Mark likes to tell uh, the stories of Jesus healing people and showing acts of power, and he, he expands them. He makes them more vivid. I like to call Mark's gospel the lickety-split gospel because it moves along rapidly. Uh, Mark has a penchant for two words that you're going to see in this morning's text. The word and, as in, and then Jesus did this, and then Jesus did that, and then Jesus did the other. And is one. The other word is immediately. Loves the word immediately. You'll see that throughout our passage. So let's take a look at Mark chapter 1 beginning at verse 21. And always you want to read a text in its context. So let me uh, remind you of what has happened right before this. Mark has begun his gospel with the adult Jesus. Jesus has been baptized by his cousin John the Baptist with sinners in the Jordan River. God has spoken at his baptism, declaring that this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. With that assurance... Jesus then goes into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Uh, then he uh, gives his first sermon, which we'll look at in a few minutes. He calls his disciples, and then we have our passage today. Let's begin with verse 21. And, see, there Mark goes, and they went into Capernaum. Now let's just stop right there. Some of you have traveled to the Holy Land. Some of you have gone there with us. And you, no doubt, have been to Capernaum, but I wanted to tell you about it and give you a sense of, of where it was and what it was like. So let's take a look at this first slide. Capernaum was Jesus' home base. He uh, likely lived in Peter, Peter's mother-in-law's home, right in this fishing village on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. This next slide is an aerial of that area. It's beautiful there. Uh, you can see that round cathedral, a Catholic church that's been built over where Jesus lived, likely. And then there in the white building, that's the synagogue where this event happened. But let me qualify that. Let's go to the next slide. Capernaum is actually Kephar Nahum, meaning the village of Nahum, the prophet. As you go in these gates, you begin to see, uh, next slide, 
the outline of the synagogue where this event we're reading about happened. This is the white synagogue. Let's go to the next slide. And there's a sign there, and I'll just tell you, it says the white synagogue of the fourth century AD. It was built over the synagogue of Jesus, which was not white stone, but black basalt. Let's go to the next slide. This is the interior of that synagogue. So imagine being there watching the event that we're gonna continue reading. Let's keep going. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he, Jesus, entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. You see, the scribes were interpreters of the tradition. So they took the law of Moses and interpreted it for the complexities of life in their day. They didn't give you fresh teaching. They gave you uh, reinterpreted ancient teaching. Jesus gave fresh teaching. So he, had, he was as one who had authority, not as the scribes. And immediately, there we go again, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Luke, in his parallel passage, says this was a man with a demon uh, and an impure spirit. And he cried out, what have you to do with us? Notice that plural, isn't that interesting? What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But, in Greek, and, Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching. With authority, he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And at once, in Greek, immediately, his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Uh, Lord, you are the embodied, powerful word of God. And your word had power then, and your word has power now. So form us, shape us, and direct us by your word. In your name we pray, amen. How many of you are old enough to remember the comedian Flip Wilson? Raise a hand. I figured as much in the nine o'clock service. <laughs> I remember too. Flip, Flip Wilson was the uh, black American comedian in the early 1970s who got his start by being on the Ed Sullivan Show and on the Johnny Carson Show. And Flip Wilson, I know and remember, I was a small child at the time, but I remember uh, Flip Wilson because my sister had been given a Flip Wilson doll. And here's a picture of it. <laughs> now, Flip Wilson, some of you may remember, had a, a lot of various characters he uh, did, and one of them was the backside of this doll, Geraldine. Do you remember her? The interesting thing about this doll is that you had a, a pull cord, and when you pulled it, various recordings of Flip Wilson would come out. And Geraldine's voice would come out, and she would say, I bet some of you remember what she said. It was this, the devil made me buy this dress. <laughs> and Flip Wilson began to be known as sort of the comedian who popularized the saying, the devil made me do it. The point is, Flip Wilson in the early 1970s uh, gave a humorous take on the demonic. But right about that time, this movie came out. Remember this movie? This next slide? The Exorcist. The popularized novel by William Peter Blatty came out in about 1973. It was the highest grossing R-rated movie until 2017. And uh, though I have not seen it and never intend to, uh, I want to be able to sleep at night. Um, <laughs> It was apparently a very terrifying movie. And so we've gone from, at about the same time in the early 70s, the humorous with Flip Wilson regarding the demonic to the horrific. And so it seems to me we live between these poles and we need to figure out what we believe about the demonic. Now, most mainline churches are very skeptical when it comes to the demonic. I don't know if some of you know the name Francis McNutt. Francis McNutt was a uh, Franciscan, no, excuse me, a Dominican priest 
who uh, left the priesthood, got married, and began a healing ministry that was world famous. Francis McNutt and his wife were part of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement. And McNutt has written extensively on the deliverance uh, of evil spirits. Now, why does McNutt seem compelling to me? Well, partly it's his education. He's Harvard trained, and he has a PhD in theology. But here's what McNutt observes about our skepticism in the mainline churches. He writes, the established worldview of mainline theologians and scripture commentators is that demon possession and exorcism come out of a primitive, superstitious worldview that we have fortunately escaped, but which Jesus, a man of his day, accepted. The main reason for our skepticism is that scientific rationalism, the predominant worldview since the so-called enlightenment of 200 years ago, has now become the dominant worldview of Western Christians. Rationalism has many gifts to give us, and so did the enlightenment. However, by dispelling for us the possible reality of the demonic, it has done us a disservice. And so we need to figure out where we land on this issue of the demonic. And I think C.S. Lewis gives us a great suggestion in a very famous quote you, many of you have heard. From the screw tape letters, that fanciful set of letters from a senior devil instructing a junior devil on how to tempt a Christian. In the preface, Lewis writes this. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race, the human race, can fall about the uh, devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence, the skeptical wing. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. Where do we land, I wonder? Where do we land on this spectrum regarding the demonic, supernatural, personal evil? Well, I think it's always a good uh, approach to go back to the Bible. And I want to start at the beginning of Mark's gospel and set this whole event we've read about in its context. Mark begins the gospel with these words, the beginning, that is an echo of Genesis chapter 1, the beginning. It's a, a new creation is emerging, the beginning of the good news, the gospel, the evangel about Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. So Mark's whole gospel is this emphasis on the good news. Now, what exactly is the good news? Fast forward 14 verses to the shortest and first sermon of Jesus. Don't you wish preachers could preach this briefly? <laughs> this is brief indeed. The time has come, Jesus preaches. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Let's unpack that. The time has come. In other words, the old era is giving way to the new era. The old era of darkness, death, and destruction is giving way to the new creation in Jesus. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. The reign of God, the rightful reign of God has now come in his ministry to take over the wrongful reigns of darkness and evil. So there is a kingdom in God, in Jesus Christ, that is coming. And now comes the sermon's application section. Repent, change your mind, turn around and away from those old allegiances, and believe, trust in, this good news, this gospel. Jesus, now in this context, shows forth the kingdom of God in three main ways. His preaching and teaching, his healings, and his demonic deliverance ministry. All of these are demonstrations of the kingdom. They're so-called calling cards of Jesus. In other words, he's authenticating, verifying that he is, in fact, the leading edge of God's kingdom that has come. And so all that we see in the gospel has got to come back to this source, this idea that the gospel, the good news is the kingdom, has come in the ministry of Jesus. And this kingdom in Jesus sets up a clash a clash of the kingdoms. So let's continue with another McNutt quote. A major theme in the New Testament is the clash between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. 
The climax of human history, in fact, occurs when God in Jesus overpowers Satan and frees the human race from Satan's dominion. This, folks, is the point of Easter. Easter does this. It it brings forth the clash of kingdoms, and it is the triumph of God's kingdom in the resurrection of Christ. That's why we have this, uh, this, uh, the saying, this, these verses. And McNutt is very clear as he continues in this next quote. Note this. To remove the thread of the exorcism ministries of Jesus and the disciples, as the skeptical wing of the church might do, would be to destroy the fabric of Mark's account. Moreover, it would not be honest to take literally language of the New Testament about a Holy Spirit and to psychologize the language referring to an unclean spirit. Do you get that? Is we don't get to willy-nilly sift through and say, well, we'll accept the supernatural good things, but oh, let's not talk about and let's not believe in the supernatural bad things. They're all part of the same fabric, the fabric that Jesus comes to bring and address. Friends, the Old Testament and the New Testament teach the reality of personal evil, of demonic evil, and the reality of God's powerful goodness. Remember what Paul so clearly wrote in the New Testament. Let's look at Ephesians 6 briefly. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, not against human beings, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul was very clear about that. So what are we supposed to do with all this? What are we supposed to make of this? I think what we're being challenged to do is to develop a worldview that embraces science and faith, a worldview that embraces the natural and the supernatural, the material and the physical, How many of you have heard of the writer Scott Peck? Scott Peck uh, was noteworthy in the mid-1980s for publishing a book called The Road Less Traveled. And why is Scott Peck so interesting and why did he make such an impact on the church in America? Because Scott Peck was trained by Harvard and Case Western Reserve as a medical doctor in psychiatry. And he became a Christian. And he spent a lot of his time writing about and researching good and evil. And then his, he shifted even to the exploration of demonic evil. And uh, then f- wrote this book, the Glimpses of the Devil, which, let me just say, is not a bedtime read. Uh, this you want to read with the lights on in the middle of the day. But it's a a psychiatrist's personal accounts of possession, exorcism, and redemption. And Scott Peck grabs our attention because he's scientifically trained, he's a medical doctor, and he's a believer. And uh, what Scott Peck does that is so helpful is he distinguishes between psychiatry and possession, or mental illness and demon possession. And particular, he looks at multiple personality disorder and demon possession. And he sees that there are a lot of similarities, but there are also differences. The diagnostic criteria for demon possession is different than multiple personality disorder. And what Peck points out, and much of the literature does, is that in order to determine conclusively which is which, you need the gift of discernment. There is a spiritual gift in the New Testament called the discernment of spirits. Paul writes about this. And people who have this gift, and there are several in this church who do, can intuit, can determine what the source of a particular personal problem could be. And discernment is necessary. Now, let's be clear. We use our God-given reason when we come to someone who's deeply troubled. We don't want to just jump to supernatural conclusions. We want to use our rationality, our minds. I believe in using what has been called Occam's razor. Occam's razor. William of Occam was a late medieval philosopher and theologian, and he basically said this. He said, the simplest, leanest, most elegant explanation is usually the right one. So if someone presents with a lot of bizarre behaviors, the most likely answer for the cause is emotional trouble, 
or psychological illness or something like that. So we begin there, but we may not stop there because the Holy Spirit can guide us into a deeper analysis and assessment of the person's problems. So we want to keep these things together. As I read and studied and reminded myself of a lot of this literature, I wanted to share some important insights with you that uh, could be helpful. A couple, a couple sort of randomly, here we go. In the West, our affluent, educated West, the demonic is likely more subtle and hidden. You, you tend to see, if you're aware of it, evil goes through systems and structures here. It doesn't come out in an overt sort of demonic way. It doesn't need to. It's more effective being under the surface. That's in the West. However, if you travel to the East or places where the gospel has not penetrated, you see an entirely different thing. If you go, for example, to India, as I have gone a couple times, it is what I like to refer to as the wild, wild east, spiritually speaking, because there is a palpable evil in some contexts, particularly the religious context. Uh, when Rupali and I were there in 1988, we visited with her aunt the Kali Temple in Calcutta, India, Kolkata. And uh, we, we thought it was an innocent excursion with her very devout Hindu aunt. And so we, we gathered around this temple, and when they opened the doors, the crowds flooded in and swept us down into the, the, the bottom of this area where you could see the bloodthirsty image of Kali. And I don't know how to describe it to you other than to say that there was a thickness of evil in the place. It was scary, it was terrifying. We found ourselves repelled by it and going up against the flow of people to get out and away from it. Many, many things happened on that trip, and we, we felt the palpable presence of evil. And this is not uncommon in the East or places where the gospel has not gone. Talk to your missionaries. They will tell you this is not uncommon. A couple other thoughts to keep in mind. According to the literature, and those who know it better than I do, full-on possession, where the demon takes over the entire personality of an individual, is very rare. However, demonic affliction or attack or oppression is quite common, and most deliverance ministries focus on that. Uh, I personally have been under experiences like that several times in my life, and I can attest to the reality of that experience. Another thing to keep in mind is that possession is typically a result of dabbling in the occult. Almost always, a person has dabbled in the Western context in the occult. Very often, that's been driven by an emotional, an uh, underlying emotional deficit or problem. And almost always, these give way to a uh, demonic. So there's a lot of things to keep in mind here. But if I'm you right now, I'm wondering, hmm, what's the take home? What should I do with all this? So let me just make a couple short suggestions and we'll be finished. What's the take home? I think we need to embrace a both and and not either or worldview. Both science and faith, both the natural and the supernatural, uh, both the material and the spiritual. I think this is what the Bible indicates is a, a good and healthy place for us to be in. So we need to embrace a both and, and I wonder where you are on that spectrum and whether or not you've come here mostly with an either or worldview. Secondly, we need to be discerning, and we need to avoid extremes. We can't just simply say, well, the devil made me do it, or there's a devil under every bush, or every bad habit, every affliction is demonic. No, we need to be discerning. We need to avoid extremes one way or another. Third thing, we need to shun the demonic in all its forms. By this, I mean we should not dabble in the occult. If you have played with a Ouija board, please never do it again. If you have children or grandchildren who might be interested in playing with a Ouija board, remove it from them. It's not benign. My wife has had experiences with this in her childhood that were very haunting. So shun the demonic in all its forms, tarot cards, palm reading, astrology, Ouija boards, things like that are not benign. Okay, a fourth thing, shore up your spiritual armor. Remember Ephesians 6, there Paul instructs us to, to put on the full armor of God. And we need to avoid chinks or beware of chinks in our armor. What do I mean by this? Well, stubborn sins, 
Stubborn, unconfessed sins in our lives can be entry points for a greater evil. Uh, Hidden addictions, uh, destructive habits, these things can become, uh, like I say, entry points for something more malign. We need to, if necessary, go to a next step, and that's to get appropriate help. Very often, if we are struggling, or those we love are struggling um, mentally or psychologically, the first thing to do is to get compassionate counseling. Uh, We and the church staff can refer you or your loved one to appropriate Christian counseling. Um, It may be something that needs more than that. It could need medication, it could need prayer, it could need deliverance ministry. You know, at every church service you come to here, we always say the prayer ministers are here. They're here for a a wide variety of reasons, including praying over people who are afflicted with uh, something more malign. So get appropriate help. And then lastly, above all, draw near to Jesus. You know, the best thing we can do is be in close relationship with him because he's the one who preserves and keeps us. He's the one who protects us. His victory on the cross is real. His resurrection power is decisive. And so these are reasons we need not fear. Uh, So above all, draw near to Jesus. Friends, remember this verse, 1 John 3, 8. When it comes to the battle between good and evil, there is no contest. John writes, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Remember that. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. And this, friends, is the hopeful message of Easter. Let's close with Scott Peck's quote. The resurrection which season we're in now of Easter. The resurrection symbolizes not only that Christ overcame the evil of his day two millennia ago, 2,000 years ago, but that he overcame it for all time. Christ impotently nailed upon the cross is God's ultimate weapon. That is our encouragement, and that is what we saw in our text. Let me pray for you. O oh Lord, we worship and praise you, Jesus, as the incarnate Son of God, the living and powerful Word of God. And we thank you that your power is conclusive, that you have dealt a death blow to death itself and to evil. We worship you, we thank you, and we pray for your kingdom of light and love and righteousness to spread even now over our world of darkness, death, and destruction. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.
Please join me in prayer. God, sometimes it's hard to keep our eyes on the good news of your kingship as evil manifests itself in this world. We see wars in Ukraine and Syria, Myanmar and Libya. We hear of terrorist actions in Algeria and South Sudan and a dozen other countries. We read of shootings in our own country in Duluth and Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, Sacramento, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and a dozen others in this month alone. We know of friends and neighbors that have suffered from mass shooting here in Boulder. We know friends and family that have suffered in the Marshall Fire. And we know from loss that they've suffered from losses of friends or family. And we have friends, family, and neighbors that are currently sick and are injured. These all can be overwhelming, Lord, especially as these events are piped to us directly from around the world. Many of us are tired. Lord, help us to rightfully mourn these events while we pray for the victims. We also pray for a reduction in these hostilities. We pray that the soldiers in battle would protect the lives of the non-combatants. We pray that you would speak your will into the minds of leaders. We pray for the leaders of our own country as well. We ask that you give them wisdom to keep us united and to know how to come alongside the combatants to reduce the killing and to foreshorten these wars. We pray that those who would commit terrorist acts would instead be heard through more peaceful means. And for those that are suffering from injury and illness, we pray your healing grace that would come upon them. Help us also, Lord, to stay focused on you and your calling for us. Help us to recognize what opportunities you are putting before us and where you want us to make a difference with our friends and family and coworkers. Help us also, Lord, to do less so that we can relate to others better. Help us to keep the Sabbath, O Lord, to keep a day of rest that we know that we need. Finally, Lord, I lift up this church and its staff and its congregation. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. Sanctify them by the truth of your word. I pray for your grace to come upon this church, to fill it with your love and your truth and your grace so that it overflows into the community around it, bringing glory to you. I pray for all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, thank you for worshiping with us this Sunday. Uh, if you've brought a prayer need that you would like prayer for, we have our prayer ministers over here who do such a fine job. Please be sure to seek them out for a prayer concern that you might have or someone you care about might have. Uh, there are boxes in the back. If you've brought an offering, would like to give to that, please feel free. But I want to send you forth with a blessing. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may overflow in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great week. Thank you.